Welcome to the inaugural episode of Echoes of Existence. Today, in our journey through the echoing labyrinth of thought, we delve deep into the intellectual landscape crafted by Friedrich Nietzsche in his seminal work, Beyond Good and Evil. Like explorers of an untouched land, we'll traverse the peaks of fervent arguments, then plunge into the challenging depths of counter-arguments, each viewpoint helping us decode the cryptic messages of this timeless philosophical opus. If our echo resonates with you, if our contemplations ignite your intellect, we urge you to like, subscribe and share this introspective exploration. Let your insights illuminate our comments section and together let's voyage through the intricacies of existence. Beyond the flickering shadows of perceived reality, beyond the comfort of our dearly held convictions, there exists a realm, a realm explored by a profound philosopher and cultural critic named Friedrich Nietzsche. Here in the depthless expanse of his mind, Nietzsche penned the magnum opus Beyond Good and Evil. It is a dance of thoughts, a symphony of ideas, challenging, inspiring and bewildering in equal measures. A journey into the heart of our shared existence, stripping away the veneers of societal norms and moral dogma, unveiling the naked dance of power, will and existence. Our voyage begins in the realm of prejudices of philosophers, when Nietzsche nudges us to discard our metaphysical spectacles, the rose-tinted glasses through which we view the world. Instead, he invites us to gaze into the abyss of existence, naked and unadorned. It's as if we've been stargazing with a telescope all along, only to be asked to observe the night sky with our bare eyes, to witness the cosmos in its raw, untamed splendour. Next, Nietzsche weaves the fabric of free spirits, those daring souls who dare to venture beyond the conventional boundaries of thought, those unafraid to tread the untamed wilderness of ideas. These spirits, Nietzsche suggests, are the true explorers of our intellectual landscapes, the pioneers who venture into the uncharted territories of thought, unshackled by societal norms or moral absolutes. But beneath the glow of these free spirits, darker questions lurk. Is their freedom a beacon of enlightenment or a lighthouse leading us into treacherous waters? Nietzsche then guides us into the arena of the religious nature, where he gazes upon religion not as a moral compass, but as a manifestation of our will to power, our desire for dominance. Religion, he suggests, is not a pathway to transcendental truth, but a theatre of power, a dance of dominance and submission. It's as though we've been watching a serene ballet all along, only to discover that beneath the graceful leaps and twirls, a fierce battle rages. Nietzsche's exploration continues into the depths of morality, where he strips away the veneer of good and evil to reveal the raw machinations of power beneath. He challenges the binary of good and evil, proposing instead a spectrum of power dynamics. His words echo like a thunderstorm, shattering our comforting illusions, forcing us to question our own moral compass. Yet within this storm, one can't help but wonder, are we glimpsing a profound truth or are we staring into a storm of Nietzsche's own creation? In Natural History of Moral, Nietzsche proposes that our moral codes, rather than being divine commandments, are a product of our historical and cultural evolution. Morality, he suggests, is not a sacred river flowing from the divine, but a man-made canal, its course determined by the shifting sands of culture and power. But beneath the ripples of this thought-provoking proposition, a daunting question remains. If morality is a human construct, then where do we anchor our sense of right and wrong? As we delve into we scholars, Nietzsche presents the image of scholars not as impartial seekers of truth, but as participants in the game of power. Their quest for knowledge, he suggests, is not a dispassionate pursuit, but a reflection of their will to power. It's as if we've been observing a tranquil lake, only to discover it's not water that fills it, but quicksilver, a mirror reflecting our own desires and fears. Finally, Nietzsche invites us to gaze upon our virtues, not as moral absolutes, but as reflections of our cultural, historical and personal biases. Virtues, he proposes, are not stars guiding us through the night, but lanterns that we carry. They're light shaped by our hands, 
They glow a reflection of our inner selves. Yet within this luminescent exploration, a haunting question looms. If virtues are subjective, then where do we find the light to guide us through the darkness of existence? As our exploration of beyond good and evil draws to a close, we find ourselves standing on the precipice of thought, gazing upon the vast landscape of Nietzsche's philosophy. It is a terrain that's unsettling and exhilarating in equal measures. A journey that doesn't just challenge our perceptions, but also forces us to question the very foundations of our existence. In Nietzsche's words, we don't just discover an exploration of morality and power, but a mirror reflecting our own fears, desires and contradictions. A mirror that invites us to venture beyond good and evil into the heart of our shared human condition. As we bid adieu to our introductory summary, we stand at the precipice of our main arguments in favour of Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil. A mosaic of perspectives lies ahead, waiting to be traversed each argument, a marker on our journey into the depth of Nietzsche's mind. Prepare to delve into the rich world of thought and challenge your notions of morality and truth. It's argument one, the mirage of moral absolutism. Nietzsche in Beyond Good and Evil drives a shattering force into the seemingly unbreakable bedrock of moral certainty, challenging the accepted narrative that ethical values are bestowed upon us from an almighty divinity. He insists that we envisage these moral doctrines as nothing more than fragile human constructs, creations of the social, historical and personal biases that permeate our existence. Picture, if you will, a world where the moral laws, hitherto considered immutable and universal, now appear as ephemeral as a desert mirage. The oasis of certainty that we thirsted for turns out to be a shifting mutable panorama of ethical subjectivity. Every grain of its sand subject to the winds of individual perspectives. Nietzsche's exploration of morality as a construct, rather than a divine mandate, is a breathtaking journey into the heart of our ethical edifice. It's as if we have been gazing at a grand tapestry all along, only to discover that it is woven from threads of power, dynamics and societal norms. This perspective peels away the shroud of moral dogma, revealing a landscape of values shaped by culture, history and personal biases. However, the vista it reveals, though intellectually fascinating, may also feel unsettling. Akin to suddenly discovering the earth beneath our feet, is not solid ground, but shifting sands. Argument two, the Free Spirit's Rebellion. In the society's grand theater, a drama of conformity unfolds. The actors dutifully following the script penned by societal norms. Enter Nietzsche's rebels, the Free Spirits. They reject the script, ad-libbing lines that challenge, question, and unsettle. They transform the conventional narrative, introducing plot twists that disturb the comfortable predictability of the established storyline. The tranquil pond of conformity is stirred, transforming into a river flowing with the fresh, dynamic currents of original thought. Argument 3. The Unmasking of Religion Nietzsche sees religion as a mask worn by human frailty and fear. Beneath the divine visage, it serves as a comfort against existential uncertainty and the fear of mortality. The doctrines, ceremonies and hymns are less about divine decree and more about providing an illusory sense of certainty and order in the face of life's inherent chaos. Religion, according to Nietzsche, is not a divine revelation, but a puppet show staged by power. The sanctity of divine commandments, the sanctuaries of religious reverence, the hymns of devotion all are revealed as marionettes their strings manipulated by power's deft hands. The drama of religion thus unfolds on a worldly stage, each act and scene choreographed by the dance of power. Argument 4. The Dance of Aphorism Nietzsche presents his ideas not as a linear argument, but as a dance of aphorisms. Each concept stands on its own, self-contained, inviting us to approach knowledge not as a predetermined narrative, but as a mosaic of individual insights that interact and contrast in a dynamic way. Argument 5. The Scholar's Predicament Nietzsche critiques scholars for their inclination to be dogmatic and their subservience to their disciplinary paradigms. Rather than being fearless explorers of truth, scholars often become captive to their existing systems of thought, 
unable to embrace novel ideas that challenge their established norms. Nietzsche shatters the illusion of academia as an objective pursuit of knowledge. The quiet halls of scholarship, he argues, are no more than a chessboard, with scholars as the engaged players, their every move dictated by the power dynamics at play, their intellectual pursuit becomes a strategic game of power, each pawn advanced, each queen sacrificed a testament to their will to power. Argument six, virtue, a hall of mirrors. Virtue for Nietzsche is not a constant entity, but an evolving reflection. It's not a fixed point in the moral compass, but a shifting image formed and reformed in the hall of mirrors that is our personal and cultural biases. The moral North Star we navigate by is not a fixed celestial body, but a pattern of constellations that shift and morph with each change in societal and individual perspective. Argument 7. The Irresistible Current of the Will to Power Nietzsche postulates that the will to power is the driving force, the potent current that runs beneath the surface of human behaviour. We are not mere objects floating on the surface of existence. Instead, we are dynamic forces, swept along by the torrents of power, shaping our path through the currents of life with our will. Argument 8. The Primal Human Animal Nietzsche presents an unvarnished portrait of humanity, stripped of the pretense and decoration the divine decree provides. We are not divine creations, but primal creatures governed by the same drives that dictate the actions of all animal species. Our humanity is not a majestic masterpiece, but a raw sketch, unadorned and honest. Argument 9. The Death of God Nietzsche issues a seismic pronouncement, that of the death of God. This declaration disrupts the very foundations of religious and moral orthodoxy. It changes our spiritual landscape, as if the familiar constellations in the night sky dissolve into stardust, leaving us with a celestial map that we must reinterpret. Argument 10. The birth of the Übermensch. Nietzsche proposes the rise of the Übermensch, a being who overthrows divine dictation to forge their own destiny. The transformation from a divine creation bound by divine edicts to an Übermensch who flies on the wings of personal will is not merely evolution, but a metamorphosis. Having navigated the seas of affirmation, celebrating Nietzsche's introspective brilliance, it is now time to set sail into stormier waters, the domain of counter-arguments. These viewpoints stand firm, questioning our accepted understanding, bringing balance to our narrative journey through beyond good and evil. Tighten your mental life jackets, dear viewers, for we are about to navigate the turbulent waves of contradiction, promising a journey filled with profound understanding and insight. Counter-argument one, the fluidity of moral sand. The image of morality as a shifting desert of subjectivity may seem liberating, but does it not also introduce a dangerous uncertainty? If every grain of ethical truth is constantly shifting, subject to individual perspectives, what anchor do we have to tether our actions to? Counter-argument to the fractious free spirits. Nietzsche's free spirits may indeed bring a refreshing dynamism to societal norms, but can their rebellious spirit not also cause friction? When every individual seeks to create their own narrative, society may transform from a harmonious chorus into a cacophony of discordant voices. Counter-argument three, the puppet show of power. Nietzsche portrays religion as a puppet show orchestrated by power. However, such a perception might risk eclipsing the potential for genuine spiritual insight and growth. Might there not be strands of divine truth intertwined in the strings of power? Counter-argument four, the dance of the damned. Life as a dance guided by our will to power seems empowering, yet it begs the question, do we all hear the same music? Are we all equipped with the same grace to execute this power dance? Or will some of us inevitably stumble, leading to a dance of destruction? Counter-argument 5. The Chessmen of Power The vision of scholars as chessmen in the game of power might indeed cast light on hidden power dynamics. However, could it not also undermine the value of intellectual pursuit? When knowledge becomes a game of power, does the pursuit of truth not lose its purity? Counter-argument 6. The wandering compass of virtue. A fluid concept of virtue seems refreshingly dynamic, 
But can it not also lead to a state of moral confusion? If our moral compass is constantly shifting, guided by personal and societal biases, how can we navigate our ethical path without losing our way? Counterargument 7. The Monotone Symphony of Power The will to power may indeed drive our actions, but is it the only force at work? The melody of human nature is woven from a multitude of feelings, desires and experiences. By focusing only on power, do we not risk reducing the rich symphony of life to a monotone dirge? Counter-argument 8. The Ignored Celestial Spark By presenting us as primal creatures, Nietzsche acknowledges our animal instincts. However, such a perception may risk eclipsing the spiritual element of human existence. Are we not also celestial beings, capable of rising above our primal instincts to touch the divine? Counter-argument 9. The Godless Sky Nietzsche's pronouncement of the death of God certainly revolutionizes our spiritual landscape. Yet it also leaves a void, a black hole in our spiritual firmament. Without divine guidance, are we not left to fumble in the darkness, seeking answers in an uncharted universe? Counter-argument 10. The burden of the Übermensch. Nietzsche's Übermensch may embody liberation from divine dictation, but such freedom also carries a heavy burden. Are we all prepared to shoulder the responsibility of creating our own destiny? Or might some of us buckle under the weight, longing for the comforting embrace of divine guidance? As the curtains fall on our exploration of Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, we find ourselves standing at the threshold of enlightenment, cradling a basket of thoughts, contemplations, arguments and counter-arguments. Thank you for journeying with us through this echoing labyrinth of existence. If our journey has kindled the lantern of your intellect, we urge you to like, subscribe and share this introspective exploration. Allow your thoughts to paint our comments section with diverse hues of perception. And together, let's make Echoes of Existence a harmonious symphony of thought and discourse. Let's rendezvous in our upcoming episodes, each one a new voyage into the profound realms of existence.